Yes, folks, that's right. The hour of the time is back. We have not met with any unfortunate or unforeseen anything, as many of you may have thought. I want to thank all of you who called WWCR and Swiss America Trading, wondering what happened to the hour of the time. WWCR has been experiencing some kind of difficulties that resulted in the hour of the time being cut off precipitously during four programs over the last three nights. And between the cutoff of the hour of the time during this time slot last night and now, they have been working to iron out those problems. And I have been assured that without any unforeseen new difficulties or accidents, that it will not happen again. So we are here to continue where we left off before we were so unexpectedly terminated in the middle of the broadcast last night. We will also be in our regular time slot later tonight which is 9 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Mountain, 11 Central, and Midnight Eastern Standard Time. The hour of the time will be heard at this earlier time slot until further notice. And it's going to depend upon the reaction of the listening audience as to whether we maintain this time slot and our later time slot, or whether we give this one up and go back to our regular one hour a night programming. So if you want this program, the hour of the time, to continue in this early time slot, 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 Mountain, 7 Central, and 8 Eastern Standard Time, you need to call Swiss America Trading and let them know, ladies and gentlemen. Airtime costs an awful lot of money. None of the money from Swiss America Trading goes into my pockets or anyone's pockets here or anyone connected with Taji. They pay only for the airtime. They believe in the message of this program. They believe in what we are trying to do. And that is wake the sheeple, empower the people, and save freedom for not just this country, but for the world. If you believe that this is an important message, then you need to talk to our sponsor. Irregardless of what happens during this time slot, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue with the later programming of the hour of the time. We will be in this time slot for at least another week, maybe longer. How many of you have seen USA Today, today's issue? December the 29th. If you have not, go out and purchase a copy of USA Today, the issue for today, December the 29th. Now, if you've been listening to the hour of the time for any appreciable length of time, you know that I said during this program that 1994 will be the year that they take the guns away from the American people. And once again, it looks like I'm going to be correct. I hate being so right all the time, folks, because it does not bode well for us. Believe me. Don't go away. I'll be right back.
Federal Reserve is a central bank. That's right. It is a central bank. A central bank attains, ladies and gentlemen, its commanding position from its governmentally granted monopoly of the currency issue. And this is often the unsung key to its power. Invariably, private banks are prohibited from issuing notes and the privilege is reserved to the central bank. Now, that's the first quote, one of four, that I left off with yesterday. And we're going to continue from that point. We talked about the Federal Reserve being made up of 12 centrally located Federal Reserve banks in the 12 Federal Reserve regions of the United States. You learned that the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It is not owned by the federal government. We talked about a court case where the court revealed the fact that, and I will quote the court's own words, quote, we conclude that the Federal Reserve banks are not federal instrumentalities for purposes of the FTCA or Federal Tort Claims Act, but are independent, privately owned, and locally controlled corporations." Unquote. Among the findings of the court are, the banks can sue and be sued in its own name, and each carries its own liability insurance. Each bank is statutorily empowered to conduct activities without day-to-day -day direction from the federal government. Unlike federal agencies, each bank may hire and fire at will. Bank employees do not participate in the civil service retirement system. The banks receive no appropriated funds from the Congress. The banks pay local property taxes and postage. Federal government agencies don't, and that's one of the tip-offs to the criminal, illegal, and privately owned Federal Reserve system, and its collection arm, the Internal Revenue Service. You see, if you receive a letter from the Internal Revenue Service, it will have postage on it, either in the form of regular postage stamps or metered postage. Federal government agencies don't. Mr. Lewis had sued the wrong institution. Imagine the zero contingency fee look on his lawyer's face as they discovered that suing the federal government would not get them one single penny from the Federal Reserve. Incredible, you say? Well, simply call directory assistance in any of its 12 district cities, which are Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Richmond, Atlanta, Chicago, St. Louis, Minneapolis, Kansas City, Dallas, and San Francisco, and ask if the Federal Reserve is listed under government or business. I have here in front of me the 1991 Minneapolis phone book listing, and the Fed, the Federal Reserve, is listed under business just after Federal Express, which, by the way, for those of you who are really deep asleep, who are so covered with wool that you can't even reach out and touch anything, the Federal Express is not an agency of the United States government either. Even federal officials admit that, quote, the federal government has not a dollar's worth of stock in the Federal Reserve System. That statement came from W.P.G. Harding, who was the governor of the Federal Reserve Board, and he made that statement in 1921. 
In a computer world job advertisement, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco pointed out, quote, some people still think we're a branch of government. We're not. We're the bank's bank. The importance of the Fed being privately owned is this, is this. Congress had no authority to grant a private consortium of banks the monopoly privilege to create out of thin air the nation's currency. Do you understand that, sheeple? Congress had no authority to grant a private consortium of banks the monopoly privilege to create out of thin air the nation's currency. First of all, Congress was never authorized by the Constitution to issue currency only to mint constitutional gold or silver money into coin form. And second, Congress is not permitted to delegate any of its authority, especially authority it never had to begin with. That is crucial to the concept of balance of power. Andrew Jackson said this as he vetoed the bank bill of 1836, quote, If Congress has the right, which it does not, to issue paper money, it was given to them to be used by themselves and not to be delegated to individuals or corporations, unquote. And, of course, when he said to issue paper money, he meant currency. Even if the Congress was empowered to issue currency, which is a money substitute, and delegate its authority, it could not delegate such to private corporations. If it could, then what's to prevent Congress from hiring private security firms to act as our armies and navies? Stretching this even further, what's to stop congressmen from hiring people to serve in their place? Have you ever thought of that? I mean, you could elect Bob Dole, but he could turn around, if this was all true, and just pay somebody else to go sit in his seat. If Congress had such authority, which it does not, but we wouldn't have to worry about that, would we? Their own lust for power would prevent that from ever happening, wouldn't it? Though the president nominates the Fed's seven board members, who are routinely approved by the Senate without the vicious grueling given to Supreme Court justice nominees. The Federal Reserve operates as an instrumentality for, not of, the United States. Independent of Congress is subject to neither Title V nor to the scrutiny of the Government Accounting Office, the GAO, and the Federal Reserve has never in its history been audited. The Fed is also immune from state and federal taxation. They have never paid one single penny of tax at all, ever. And, and, you're not allowed to sue them. How about that? If they were audited, it would disclose the greatest, most successful heist, theft, stick-up robbery, whatever you want to call it, in the history of the world. Now I quote from 12 United States Code 531. Federal Reserve bonds, including the capital stock and surplus therein and the income therefrom, shall be exempt from federal, state, and local taxation except taxes upon its real estate. This federally privileged tax-exempt monopoly corporation is privately owned by, according to the best knowledge available, the following eight families. The Rothschilds of Europe the Lazards of Paris, the Israel Moses Seifs of Italy, the Warburgs of Germany, and the New York Lehmans, Kuhn Loeb's, Goldman Sachs, and Rockefellers. Now let's talk about how they create currency, literally out of thin air. 
Baron de Rothschild, the Adam Smith of international banksters, said this, quote, Permit me to control the currency of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws, unquote. And in putting it simply, printed by the Boston Federal Reserve Bank, it says, quote, when you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover that check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. Creating money. And what they meant was irredeemable currency. Because as you've already learned in a previous program, money is only gold or silver coin, according to our Constitution. And according pretty much to the entire history of the world. Federal Reserve notes are no longer backed by gold or silver. We'll talk about that later. They're created out of thin air and backed solely by the ignorant cooperation of American sheeple. You see... None of this could ever happen if it were not for the stupid, apathetic, ignorant sheeple. The great herds. The great herds. And here's how the whole scam works, ladies and gentlemen. Let's say the Fed wishes to inject 500 million new Federal Reserve notes into the money supply. And I use money loosely. The Fed calls up the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and says, Hey, we'd like you guys to print up 500 million Federal Reserve notes. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing manufactures these bills for a mere 1.5 cent apiece, regardless of the bill's denomination, and sells them to the Fed at cost, at cost, 1.5 cents apiece. Therefore, the 500 million Federal Reserve notes would cost the Fed a mere 75,000 Federal Reserve notes. Let's see you buy currency for 1.5 cents per $100. Without gold or silver backing, these 500 million Federal Reserve notes are intrinsically worthless. They are counterfeit fiat. Beyond the sheeple's ignorant willingness to accept them, Federal Reserve notes have no value whatsoever. You cannot even use them as scrap paper, for they're covered with ink. The Federal Reserve is, unlike other corporations, without a true product. It creates nothing of intrinsic value, like cars or appliances, so it has nothing to sell. In fact, it creates nothing at all. It is, in fact, an act of magic. Magic. The banksters are lazy and greedy and have no intention of actually working for a living. And with these new Federal Reserve notes, the Federal Reserve simply purchases 500 million Federal Reserve notes worth of interest-bearing treasury securities which are backed by nothing more than the guaranteed future taxation of Americans. So Abra, Cadabra, Presto, Magico, just like that, right out of thin air, $500 million in Federal Reserve notes are created and backed by the future taxation of Americans, for they use those Federal Reserve notes to purchase Treasury bonds. Interest bearing, ladies and gentlemen, which means we not only have to pay back the original 500 Federal Reserve notes, which never existed in the first place, but we must pay interest on those notes. And that's why we keep getting poorer and poorer, and that's why they must continually run the presses to print more and buy more Treasury bonds, which then the federal government issues in the form of credit. In other words, they just write checks on non-existent money. How about that? 
Senator Jack Metcalf said this, quote, What further proof do we need that the Fed is not an agency of the government than to understand that when the federal government needs more money, and he also meant currency, why is it that nobody but me knows what money is? I don't mean that literally. There are a few more of us who know what it is, not many. The Fed does not merely create and print it as it would do were it a government agency. No, the Fed creates it as a loan and charges the government interest on it, unquote. Now granted, ladies and gentlemen, the Federal Reserve could spend its Federal Reserve notes and make as much as $98.98 .98 profit over its 1.5 cent cost per 100 Federal Reserve notes, but that's grossly unsophisticated for people of this ilk. Remember, the Fed is nothing but the largest counterfeiting operation in the entire world. Why spend your funny money when you can loan it out to suckers at exorbitant interest? When your debtors can't pay, simply foreclose on their mortgaged assets. Now that's, that's power over the rubes. You know what a rube is? That's what people who work in the carnival call the sheeple. Besides, folks, it's more fun than going on a mere spending spree like some cretinous lottery winner. And you really think they care if you counterfeit $100 notes in your basement? Do you really think they care? Not at all. In fact, you're printing $100 notes in your basement and putting them out on the economy actually helps hide their theft. Actually helps hide their theft. You see, because when they do this, when they do this, much of what they create is put out in the form of credit. In other words, no currency is even printed in many instances. For instance, if a Federal Reserve Bank loans you $50,000, they do not create $50,000, nor do they have it in reserve. They just make a bookkeeping enter that, that they loaned you the money. Then they either issue you a check or credit your account, in which case $50,000 has just been placed on the economy that does not exist. Now, if all of you listening to this broadcast would attempt to just get enough cash to pay off every bill that you own, you would quickly discover that there is not that much currency in existence. And I'm just talking about the listeners to this broadcast. Most of you, in your daily routine, never touch a dollar bill. You use credit cards or debit cards or you write checks. Are you beginning to understand? That's why checks were created. That's why credit cards were created. To hide the fact that the actual currency is not in existence. And in any, in any case, there is no money at all, at all, except in the vaults of Swiss American trading. Isn't this illuminating? <laughs> oh, me. You see, even though the federal government indeed manufactures Federal Reserve notes, it is forbidden to spend them without first borrowing them to the Fed, or from the Fed, I should say. Now, this sounds absolutely nuts, and it is. You see, why would the government print currency for one and a half cents per bill, sell it to the Fed for one and a half cents, and then borrow it back at face value for up to $100 plus interest? simply because the 1913 Congress sold out your family's future to the international banksters and today's Congress keeps quiet about it. That's right. That makes them co-conspirators. They are complicit in this deal. Besides, Congress doesn't pay all this interest to the Fed. You pay it. You pay it. And that is the purpose of the Internal Revenue Service, is to make sure that you pay it. And this has been going on for over 80 years, and Americans are only just now waking up to this obscenity. And it's only a few of us who are waking up. 
If the federal government controlled the central bank, like other nations, it wouldn't have to borrow currency. It would simply have the Bureau of Engraving and Printing print up however much Congress wanted and spend it directly. And there would be no interest due on it. However, no borrowing means no interest income for the banksters, so Congress added the unique feature of a privately held central bank. No other central bank in the world is owned and operated as a private business like the Federal Reserve System that I am aware of. And I tack that on to the end because I've studied our system to the ultimate. I don't much care what people are doing in their other countries except how it affects us. You see, I believe that everybody should have their own system, whatever they want, whatever they like. Unfortunately, the rest of the world better wake up to what's going on because if the United States of America loses its freedom, and it is quickly happening, and if, if propaganda ploys like that contained in USA Today for December the 29th of this day's issue succeeds, Americans will not only lose their freedoms, but will quickly become slaves. 1994, the year that I predicted the guns will be taken away from the American people. USA Today confirms that. Have you ever seen an entire newspaper devoted to one subject every page? Well, you're in for a surprise. If you have not picked up USA Today, do it. Do it now. Anyway, let's get back to fleecing the masses. You ever wonder why they call it fleecing? Fleecing, you sheeple? Back to the mechanics of the scam. Fleecing the sheeple. Since the government can't directly spend treasury securities, T-bills, notes, bonds, though from now on, I'll just call them T-bills, it wants spendable Federal Reserve notes instead. That's why government borrows Federal Reserve notes using T-bills as collateral because the government can spend the borrowed Federal Reserve notes because the sheeple are stupid enough to accept them. The Fed swap Federal Reserve notes for T-bills which make guaranteed interest. The Fed can't reap interest on its paper, the Federal Reserve notes, any more than the government can spend its paper T-bills. That's why they swap them. You see, one dirty little filthy hand just washes the other. So why doesn't the government simply sell its T-bills directly? Because, folks, investors in general no longer have any confidence in them. There's no demand for them. It's the Federal Reserve which purchases Treasury securities as the government's middleman and then issue Federal Reserve notes based on that public debt. You see, this clever process forces all of us to indirectly lend to the government. In fact, the Fed, by law, has first dibs on all newly offered T-bills. What the Fed doesn't buy, it sells through the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC, to its bankster cronies who own the only 12 firms licensed to buy through the FOMC, also called the primary market. Common Americans who have no direct interest in the Fed scam own less than a fourth of all Treasury securities existent. Interesting? It better be. It had better be, dear sheeple. <laughs> Sponsor, Swiss America Trading, can help you in the coming months and years to make sure that what you have doesn't disappear 
like a puff of smoke in the magic act as Federal Reserve notes are created out of thin air your assets disappear into thin air except for those assets that throughout the history of the world have proven to hold their value no matter what happens and that's just only one asset ladies and gentlemen precious metal in its various forms the best form is in gold or silver coins for those are readily recognized as being value as being money as having a specific intrinsic worth by anyone and in hard times you can take one of those coins gold or silver it matters not which into any alley or into any woods or into any back room and purchase whatever you need to survive on whatever market exists and those kinds of markets always exist wherever people exist in hard times and in oppressive societies we all know that if you don't have what you need to barter what you must have you will not survive it's just that simple you see because ultimately man always always comes under the laws of nature and the laws of nature proscribe that only the fittest will survive the smartest the fittest the strongest the most cunning what do you have that you could use in this market were you to have to patronize such a market the black market how would you feed your family how would you shelter them how would you bribe your way out of a prison camp I want you to look at the faces of your loved ones who are no about sitting around you now. Look at those faces, and I want you now to determine whether you can honestly tell them that you have protected them against an economic collapse against what we all know is coming and once you've had a glance at USA Today and if you understand the statistics you know that taking the guns away from the American people has not one single thing to do with crime crime is the excuse it is to protect the socialists against those of us who would rise up with gun in hand to reinstate the Constitution as the supreme law of the land legally and lawfully with the law and God on our side that is why they want the guns out of the hands of Americans they intend to destroy this nation destroy Christianity and whether you believe it or not Orthodox Judaism and all fundamentalist religions including the nation of Islam and the followers of the Prophet Muhammad because you will be asked to bow down to mammon to Baal to the old god of the sun Osiris the light Lucifer and since there are many of us who will never do that they must take our guns away from us you doubt it open your eyes move the wool away from your eyes and look at the real world and then call Swiss America trading 1-800-289-2646 that's 1-800-289-2646 they're good people there they're honest people they will treat you right
I back that statement with my personal reputation. If they ever do not treat you right, you contact me immediately. If indeed something is not right, I will ensure that it is corrected. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. Do it now, dear sheeple. You'll be glad that you did. <laughs> Katz, in his book, The Paper Aristocracy, said, quote, In reality, our government is bankrupt. The people do not have enough confidence in the government to lend it money. Were it not for the Federal Reserve, the government could not borrow enough to meet the huge deficits it runs. But the important thing to understand is that every time the Federal Reserve creates irredeemable Federal Reserve notes to lend to the government, those irredeemable Federal Reserve notes find their way into the banking system. Unquote. Money Facts from the House Banking and Currency Committee, 1964, page 9, makes this statement, quote, Every circulating... One Federal Reserve note represents a $1 debt to the Federal Reserve system. The Federal Reserve banks create Federal Reserve notes out of thin air to buy government bonds from the United States Treasury. Lending Federal Reserve notes into circulation at interest by bookkeeping entries of checkbook credit to the United States Treasury. The Treasury writes up an interest-bearing bond for $1 billion. The Federal Reserve gives the Treasury a $1 billion credit for the bond and has created out of nothing a $1 billion debt, which the American people are obligated to pay with interest. Federal Reserve notes are nothing more than Treasury securities broken up into small pieces and reissued to us ignorant, saps, sheeple, stupid, ignorant rubes at a premium. This is called monetization of debt. Eventually, these T-bills are redeemed. They always have been. And where does the Treasury get the Federal Reserve notes to pay off the Fed? Why, from the American taxpayers, that's where. It's you. It's you. Not I. It's you who pay the banksters' interest. Federal Reserve notes are nothing more than IOUs for Treasury securities, which are guaranteed taxation on our future toil. Here's a sample of how we get fleeced. Our labor is taxed by the federal government to pay off maturing treasury securities owned by the Federal Reserve, which is owned by the international banksters. How about that? Make you sleep well at night? <laughs> and you ignoramuses dare to stand up when I'm talking about saving the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and abolishing the Federal Reserve and making this country right. And the first thing out of your mouth is, how can you protect your assets? Well, screw your assets. You're going to lose your ass. And that's the truth. You want to protect what you have? Call our sponsor. If you want to make sure that you can keep what you have, you better get with me and get on target. Concentrate on your ass and forget about your assets. 
the American taxpayer, there's one born every minute. In the Income Tax, Root of All Evil by Frank Fedorov, it says, quote, government borrows on its ability to tax because taxes are its only source of revenue, the only security it has to offer the lender. You really think taxes aren't going to go up? They have no choice but to go up. They will go up and up and up and up. Because in this system, they can never go down. You're always so surprised when they increase the taxes after they promise that they won't. As if they could ever not. They must. Why are Treasury securities considered the safest investment in the world? Why? Because American taxpayers are an almost bottomless source of wealth who have always allowed themselves to be robbed, fleeced, under the guise of income taxation. That's right. And it's illegal. It's illegal. It's illegal under the Constitution, and the Supreme Court has ruled that income taxes are, in fact, an excise tax and cannot be levied against an individual or his income. Simple. You see, the American sheeple can always be counted on as suckers. It's really that simple. Are you beginning to get the picture? Income taxation is Robin Hood in reverse, robbing the poor and the middle class to pay the bankster elite. In fact, every penny of income tax you pay goes to the Federal Reserve as interest payment on the national debt. The middle class shrinks, and eventually it will disappear. And that was the reason for graduated income tax, as written in the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels. If you never heard of them, you'd better learn something about them very quickly. Because in this country, already, we have almost fulfilled every plank of the Communist Manifesto, and it will not be long until we will be owned owned under a one-world totalitarian socialist state, chained to a computer in a system of ever-increasing, never-ending debt, in a cashless society, so that the slavery can never be thrown off, and the theft and the crime can never be discovered. That's the reason they must move us into a cashless society, because as long as cash exists, the crime can eventually be discovered, even by the most stupid of the sheeple. Every penny of income tax you pay goes to the Federal Reserve as interest payment on the national debt, and for nothing else. Howard Katz in the paper Aristocracy said this, quote, In order to make exploitation worthwhile, the exploiting class must be much smaller than the exploited. If 70% of the people enslave the other 30%, they cannot get enough from them to make it worthwhile. But if 5% of the people can enslave the other 95%, then they can live in luxury off the labor of others. The problem is that 5% of the population cannot enslave 95% by pure force. The power is clearly on the side of the majority. So what's the solution to this? The solution, as practiced countless times throughout history, lies with the intellectuals. The function of the intellectual in this context is to convince the 95% majority that the system which exploits them is proper and just, or necessary and unavoidable, or external and true. In the Middle Ages, the priests preached submission to the kings and nobles and told the people that a bad ruler was the punishment of God. Rebellion was disobedience to God.
In the 20th century, we have seen a return to the medieval type of intellectual, but now he is not garbed in the robe of a priest. Now he adopts a modern point of view and dresses himself in the guise of science. No longer does he talk of ethics and theology in tune with the times. He talks of economics, but his function is the same as that of the medieval priest to rationalize and justify the current aristocracy and convince the majority of people to submit. With the enactment of a legal tender law in 1933, the basic system was created which is now leading to the formation of an American aristocracy. The bankers and the Federal Reserve have, since that time, used their privilege to create a quarter of a trillion paper Federal Reserve notes. The interest which they have charged on this fiat money represents wealth stolen from the American people. This is the basis of the system. It is to protect this income-producing privilege that the bankers are forced to expand their power and constitute themselves an aristocratic class. Do you understand it? And Howard Katz is wrong, because the priests are still preaching the same tune, only today it takes a different form. It can be called the power of positive thinking. Or what is it that uh, Reverend Schuler calls it? In the Crystal Cathedral? What does he call it, folks? In other words, it's like in the New Age community. You must never identify a problem, for that's negativity, and negativity breeds negativity. You must think positively, and no matter how bad things seem, you must find something good about it. Isn't that what you're being taught? Isn't that what you're being told? Oh, it sounds nice on Sunday morning on that TV set. Or if you're actually sitting in that big crystal monstrosity that Christ would be the first to begin to rip apart. It all sounds so nice, but where is it taking you? Where is it taking you? Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, one of President Johnson's first executive orders after taking office was to rescind the issuance of four and a half billion dollars in additional United States note currency? Now, United States note is not a Federal Reserve note and requires no interest be paid upon it. These notes in two dollar, five dollar, and one hundred dollar denominations were not Federal Reserve notes printed from 1862 to 1966, United States notes were not based upon public debt. United States notes were interest-free. It was because of the real money, the gold and silver coin minted by the United States government, represented by United States notes, which could be exchanged for real money, gold or silver coin, that this country became what it was at one time, the greatest nation in the history of this world, with the freest people, with the most opportunity, the best education, and the most promising future in the world, but not anymore. United States notes were interest-free. No interest means no indentured service and no profits. You can imagine how thrilled the banksters were about this. You can just imagine. And you should look into it. Notice how the 1928 note said, quote, will pay to the bearer on demand, unquote, while the 1963 note contains no such promise. Although the 1963 series U.S. notes were irredeemable for real money and thus inflationary, at least they did not secretly enslave the public like Federal Reserve notes. The United States notes were the last bills to be issued rather than borrowed into circulation. Lincoln's and JFK's assassinations already have many eerie similarities. 
all revolving around real money. Could their common association with debt-free currency unlock the mystery? Lincoln, after all, ladies and gentlemen, created U.S. notes back in 1862. By 1967, U.S. notes were very quietly being withdrawn. These red seal bills are a reminder that we haven't always been slaves to the privately owned Federal Reserve System. Just a reminder. Could the murderers of Abraham Lincoln and John Fitzgerald Kennedy have been the same ones who pinned this protocol? Quote, A nation or world of people who are let me start that again, folks. I'm quoting from memory, and usually I get it right. Quote, A nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Unquote. You'll find that in Chapter 1 of my book, Behold a Pale Horse. In fact, if you had purchased my book at its date, first date, I should say, I don't know how many editions have been printed by now, it's been the underground bestseller for the last three years in a row. But if you had purchased that book when it first rolled off the presses in December of 1990, you would have been awake at that point, in fact, you would have been awake until that book was finished. For everyone who picks up, behold, a pale horse does not sleep until it is finished. That is the word that reaches my ears. If you would like to have a copy, if you're a Kaji member, it's $25 postpaid. If you're not a Kaji member, it's $30 postpaid. That's $25 for CAGI members, $30 for everybody else. Send it to William Cooper, P.O. Box 1420, Sholo, spelled S-H-O-W-L-O-W, -O -W, Arizona, 85901. That's P.O. Box 1420, Sholo, Arizona, 85901. Remind me some evening to tell you the story of how this little town acquired the name Shola. Good night, dear sheeple, and God bless you all.